Our scripture reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13. And we will be focusing on all the verses. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13. And I will read it for you. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not, this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. This is an interesting passage in that the writer of this gospel, Matthew, writes about his first encounter with Jesus. He tells us about his former career, the career he had before he met Jesus, and how he left all of it behind to follow him. I'm sure that while Matthew was writing this passage, he was thinking, there was no way that I could have imagined back then how much my life would change after meeting Jesus. Who knew that I would become an apostle, a leader of the early church? Who knew that God would use me to write an inspired book about the life of Jesus? What an amazing ride it's been. I'm sure we can all say that Matthew lived quite an exciting life. But as impressive as Matthew's life was, in our passage, He doesn't want us to focus on him. No, he wants us to focus on Christ. He wants us to see the grace and kindness of this Jewish rabbi who called a great sinner to become his disciple. And at the end of our passage, he's going to point out to us what Jesus' mission was. And that is to be the great physician who would bring healing to sinners like us. So this passage takes place early on in Jesus' ministry. He is doing his ministry work along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. By now, he is already quite popular because of his miracles. And as he's walking, he sees a tax collector whose name is Matthew. Again, he's the writer of our gospel. Matthew is sitting in a tax booth with his pen, his books, and his coins, In case you don't know much about tax collectors during that time, they were among the most despised people in Jewish society, in Israel. The Israelites had to pay a lot of different taxes. They had the tithe, they had income tax, they had excise taxes, taxes on trades, and many other taxes that they were not happy about. And remember, Israel was now under Roman rule, so they had to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. And the empire needed tax collectors, so Roman officials would hire men who could could collect the most taxes, who could strip as much money as possible from the people, whether by just means or unjust means. There's a reason why when tax collectors go to John the Baptist in Luke 3 and they ask how they should repent, John the Baptist says this, don't collect more taxes than what is appointed for you. So clearly, tax collectors were extorting a lot of money from the people, and because of that, they were extremely wealthy. So the Matthew in our chapter would have been one of the most reviled people in Jewish society. Here was a Jew who was stealing money from his own people with the backing of an oppressive empire and an unclean Gentile empire at that. The Jews of his day would have shunned him. They would have considered him beyond redemption, a scumbag of society, a traitor to their nation, and the worst of sinners. So, as wealthy as Matthew was, you can imagine the pain he felt from being hated by everyone in his society. 
It was his fault for choosing a profession that was filled with so much abuse and, and corruption. But still, it couldn't have been pleasant being hated and despised by all of society. He was a man who was both very wealthy, but also very miserable and sad. But one day, while he's sitting in his tax booth, Jesus, this new rabbi, this new prophet, comes out of nowhere and just says to him in verse 9, follow me. And then Matthew immediately arose and followed him. So we see here the amazing kindness and grace of Christ. While all the other Jewish rabbis and leaders were shunning this man and despising him, Jesus not only talks to him, but tells him to become one of his 12 disciples. Jesus shows his goodness by embracing a great sinner who did not deserve any of his goodness at all. And we are reminded here <clears throat> that Christ's love and goodness towards his people, towards us, is totally undeserved. We are reminded here that Jesus called us to salvation, not on the basis of our own goodness or righteousness, but solely on the basis of his grace, mercy, and kindness. And that is a wonderful truth for us. And we see not only the kindness of Christ, but also the incredible power of his word. Think about it. Christ was able to make Matthew follow him with just a simple word, follow me. Only an infinitely powerful being could, make, could move a man's will with that kind of ease. When Christ spoke this word to Matthew, it was accompanied with the divine power that changed Matthew's will and caused him to obey Christ, which is amazing. And that is how God worked in us. When God wanted to convert us, he first brought his word to us. But that word was accompanied by an infinite power that moved our hearts to believe in Christ and, and follow him. It was solely the work of God's sovereign grace and power. God chose us, not the other way around. And that should move us to be in awe of God's might. And this calling becomes even more remarkable when we look at it from Matthew's perspective. Remember, Matthew had a very, very high-paying job as a tax collector, maybe one of the highest-paying jobs in Israel. His job brought him a ton of wealth and a ton of earthly comfort and financial security. He would have been financially set for life if he had just kept this job. And yet, when Christ's power moves in his heart, he can't help but give it all up to obey Christ and follow him. And you have to keep in mind that this is not a job that you can just return to if your plans don't work out. Once you quit a high-paying job like this, there are a hundred people who are ready to snatch it away from you and to cling on to it with their whole might. But Matthew is willing to give it all up for the advancement of Christ's kingdom. And that is a reminder for us that we too must always be willing to give up money and comfort to advance Christ's kingdom. If you look at most of the great heroes of the Christian faith, they gave up money, comfort, wealth to serve Christ. I'll give you a few examples. Martin Luther, uh, the great 16th century reformer, he could have been a great lawyer. He finished his master's, top of his class, but he gave it all up to study the word, to become a pastor, and to start the Reformation. John Calvin, same thing. He could have been one of the best lawyers, not just during his time, but in all of history, but he gave it up for the sake of Christ's kingdom. The 16th century Dutch reformers, same thing. These were brilliant men who could have been lawyers, doctors, wealthy businessmen, but they chose to give it all up for the advancement of Christ's kingdom. And because of their sacrifice, they were able to establish Protestant churches that still exist 500 years later. So we see from this passage that we should always be willing and able to give up everything to follow Christ. So after Matthew takes up his call to become a disciple, what does he do next? He celebrates by making a great banquet for Jesus at his home. And we know it was a great banquet because the Gospel of Luke tells us. So this shows us again that Matthew was a wealthy person because he was able to throw a big party with tons of people in it. Verse 10 says, While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So we see Matthew's response to Christ's grace. He responds with thankfulness, with gratitude, with joy and celebration. 
He personally experienced the goodness of Christ, and this caused him to be grateful, which manifested itself in throwing a great party for Jesus and his disciples. And he also invites his own friends, which consisted of other tax collectors and sinners. You have to know, the word sinner in this passage is being used in a special way. The Jews of that day knew that all humans were sinners. Even the Pharisees would admit that. But when the Pharisees used the word sinner, they were referring to a heinous sinner, a person who habitually engaged in heinous and infamous sins, like theft, adultery, drunkenness. And then we get a small twist in the story. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, find out that Jesus is enjoying a banquet with people they despised. So they get annoyed, and we get verse 11. When the, Ver- when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So we see the Pharisees here trying to cause Christ's disciples to revolt against him. They want these disciples to think that Jesus is engaging in sin by hanging out with these sinners. Even though their problem is with Jesus and not the disciples, they don't go to Jesus directly because they don't have the courage to confront him directly. Instead, they decide to bully the little disciples. This shows you what kind of character these men had. The the disciples don't know how to answer their question, so they do the wise thing. They go to their master and they tell him what these Pharisees said. Then we get verse 12. This is how Jesus responds to the Pharisees. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the wealthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is quite an amazing answer that Jesus gives to these Pharisees. You need to remember what the Pharisees believed about salvation. They believed that humans could earn their own salvation and eternal life by keeping the law of God. And what's more amazing is that they actually believed that they had accomplished this. These Pharisees actually believed that they had obeyed the law of God sufficiently to earn God's favor and salvation. These were proud men who had a foolish confidence in their own self-righteousness. And this explains why they said to the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? These Pharisees absolutely look down on these kinds of people, these people who live outwardly sinful lives. And not only did they look down on them, but they also believed that these kinds of people were beyond redemption, beyond salvation, that there was no way that God could ever save them. And because of this belief, they chose to utterly shun these kinds of people, tax collectors, adulterers, drunkards, and anyone else they deemed a sinner with a capital S. They believed that these people were so lost, so hopeless, that there was no point in interacting with them at all. It was better to leave them alone and not bother trying to save them and get them into heaven. In their minds, they were thinking, let's just ignore these despicable sinners and let them remain on their path to hell. Let's not bother with them. And that explains why they were so angry at Jesus for eating with people whom they considered irredeemable. They think that Jesus was hanging out with these people because he wanted to join them in their sinful ways. But this shows us that they had no idea what kind of person Jesus was. And more importantly, they had no idea what Jesus' mission was on earth. So Jesus responds with these words, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now, is Jesus implying that these Pharisees were spiritually healthy? Definitely not. Jesus knew that most of the Pharisees were among the most spiritually corrupt men in Jewish society. These were men who spread the false teaching that a man could be saved by his own works, which is the most dangerous teaching on earth because it is the very teaching that will guarantee hell to anyone who believes it. Um, Jesus knew that these men were greedy, corrupt men who cared only about their own power, wealth, and authority. So Jesus can't be saying that these Pharisees were spiritually healthy. But he is saying this. Jesus is saying that those who believe that they are spiritually healthy or spiritually righteous also believe that they have no need for a doctor. 
The root problem with these Pharisees was that they totally misunderstood the law of God and what it required. The Pharisees believed that the law of God required obedience only in your outward actions. So things like wicked thoughts and wicked desires were fine in their eyes. All they had to do was to keep the law outwardly in their actions. And be, but, but Jesus made it clear that the law of God required perfect obedience, not only in outward action, but also in your thoughts, in your affections, in your emotions, in your whole being. Remember what Jesus said. If you just have one lustful thought about a woman, you already stand condemned. You're already deserving of God's wrath. That's how strict God's law is. And because of this wrong understanding of the law of God, the Pharisees actually believed that they had kept the law of God sufficiently and had earned their own salvation, even though they really didn't. Even though the law of God fully condemned them for their inner thoughts and desires. This explains why they were so proud of their own righteousness. They were righteous according to their own wrong understanding of the law, not according to the correct understanding, which would have shown them how guilty and condemned they stood before a holy God. They believed that they were spiritually healthy when in fact they were the most spiritually sick people in society. But Matthew, this tax collector, and other tax collectors, and other sinners, these people knew that they were sinful before God. They knew that they were spiritually sick. And because they knew this, they realized that they needed a spiritual physician who could heal them and save them. And they saw that the only one qualified for this job was none other than Christ. And that's why they wanted to be around him. That's why they wanted to eat with him and to learn more about him. Then Jesus tells the Pharisees, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. This quote is from Hosea 6.6, where Hosea is speaking to the Old Testament Jews, and he's telling them that God had no pleasure in their animal sacrifices because their hearts were not right with God. The Old Testament Jews were very diligent and scrupulous in their animal sacrifices. They thought that their outward show of religion was all that God required. But Hosea was reminding them that God first cared about what was in their hearts. God is more concerned about how they loved him and how they loved their neighbor. Their animal sacrifices would only be accepted if their hearts were first right with God, if their hearts possessed true faith and a true love for God and neighbor. So when Jesus says, learn what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, He's telling the Pharisees that they should have had true mercy for these poor sinners that Jesus was eating with. They should have had compassion for these broken people who acknowledge their sin and their need for a Savior. Jesus knew that these Pharisees were flawless when it came to religious ceremonies, animal sacrifices, ritual cleansings, but their hearts were devoid of any mercy and compassion for the lost. So he tells them to go and reflect on this verse of Hosea. Then Jesus says, For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, but sinners. So Jesus here is telling the Pharisees the purpose for which he was sent into the world. He's telling them that these quote-unquote sinners, these tax collectors, these adulterers, these drunkards, these people who acknowledge their own sinfulness and misery, were the kinds of people that he came to call, that he came to save and show mercy to. Jesus' heart was for these kinds of people. The reason why Jesus came to earth was to save people who acknowledged their sin. And he's making it clear to these Pharisees that he's eating with these sinners not because he wants to join them in their sinful actions, but because he wants to show them the grace of God. And he wants to offer himself as a savior to them. Christ's mission on earth was to call sinners to salvation and repentance. And this mission would, would make no sense to people who were self-righteous, who believed that they were spiritually healthy when in fact they weren't. And if these Pharisees had known the heart of God, if they had known the compassion of God, they would have understood why Jesus was eating with sinners. And they would not have complained stupidly 
to his disciples. But they didn't know, they didn't understand the heart of God. They didn't understand Jesus' mission. And sadly, they didn't understand that they were guilty sinners who were spiritually sick and deserving of God's wrath and justice. And because of this blindness, they refused to go to the only physician who could heal them. How very sad. So let me ask you, congregation, what do you believe about yourselves? Are you like the Pharisees who are self-righteous? Do you believe that your own works could save you? Do you believe that your outward acts of religion could save you? Have you deluded yourself into believing that your sins are not a big deal, that you are not spiritually sick, that you don't need a physician? Or are you like Matthew, this despised tax collector, who understood his sin, who understood that he was deserving of God's wrath, who understood that he had a spiritual disease that only Jesus could heal? My prayer is that you are like Matthew. My prayer is that you will see your need for the great physician, Jesus Christ, who came to save sinners and to grant them the gift of his righteousness, who came to justify the guilty and condemned, who came to wash away the pollution of sin, to deliver us from God's wrath and hell, to give us the hope of resurrection and eternal life. So if you don't believe in Christ, repent and place your faith in this great physician who alone can heal you and save you. Remember, congregation, your souls are filled with sin. They're filled with spiritual disease and sickness that make you worthy of God's wrath and justice. So I tell you, look to Christ. Keep looking to him. Place your faith in this great physician whom God, out of his love, sent into this world. So may you trust in this physician and experience the healing that only he can provide. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this great physician, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that he came to call sinners to salvation. He didn't come to call people who already believed they were righteous when in fact they weren't. People who were deluded in their own righteousness. But no, he came to call sinners, the adulterers, the drunkards, the, th the thieves, the robbers. He came to call wicked people to salvation. And Lord, help us to be grateful for his grace and mercy. He had every right to crush such people, crush sinners, crush these people, crush us, Lord. But he, sh he showed mercy, and we give you thanks for that. Help us, Lord, to remember this word today. Help us to remember that we are spiritually sick. Even though we have faith in Christ, there's still much sin in our hearts, and that we need to constantly look to him. We need to remember that these sins are, um, they make us worthy of condemnation. But we also know that because of what Christ did, we don't face condemnation anymore, and we're grateful for that. So God, uh, may this word stick to our hearts this week, and um, may we be filled with the knowledge of your love for us, and may it also cause us to love you in return. Thank you for this word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.